years ago, I gave birth to my first child, and a few years later, my second. Turns out, I'm not terribly good at giving birth, and particularly after the first occasion, there was a very sick mum and a very sick baby. Now, after the birth, I was offered all forms of counselling and support to deal with my trauma. But my husband, who had witnessed everything while I floated around oblivious in a sea of morphine, was offered nothing at all. Now, I need to say at this point, otherwise I will be in trouble, that my husband didn't expect any support, thinking that the mother and the baby were the most important thing. But a year later, when I returned to work as a researcher at Oxford, I became angry. Angry that my husband, the co-parent of my child, was still visibly distressed by the experience of his first daughter's birth. So I decided to do what any academic would do, and I turned to the literature to see what my fellow academics had to say about the experience of fathers. And the answer was very little. Yes, there was an extensive literature on the negative effect that absent fathers can have on their children, and obviously this is critical and really important. But on the larger group of stick-around dads, the ones who find the rogue sock, uh, coach the football team and chase away the bedtime monsters, the literature was silent. We simply knew absolutely nothing about them. Why is this? Why, when 80% of men will become a father, do we know so little about their experience? Well, the thing is, 10 years ago when I started, it was felt that fathers had no input into their children's lives. They had no input into their development and certainly didn't form those strong attachments that a mother and a child have. And because dads didn't go through the physiological experience of giving birth, their parenting wasn't instinctive. They had to learn to parent. But this wasn't very important because the thing is, their job was limited to going to work, earning the money and instilling a bit of discipline when they got home. So our time as academics was better spent focusing on mums as the environment in which a, a child would develop. Dads just weren't particularly important. Dads are dispensable. Now, you see, the thing is, I'm an evolutionary anthropologist, and I find that conclusion rather hard to take. Because, you see, human fathers are rare. We're one of only 5% of mammals who has investing fathers, and the only ape. Now, for evolution to have invested in the changes necessary for the involved father, changes in anatomy, psychology, physiology, behaviour, they must have some input into their children's survival. They must have a role in their development. So I decided that was going to become my job, to investigate what happens to a man physiologically, anatomically, behaviourally, psychologically, when he becomes a father. How, in the absence of the experience of birth, does he form the deep attachments that we know he does to his children? And what is his role in his child's life, his family's life, and our society? And ten years later, with a growing group of colleagues, we now know this. That when a man becomes a father for the first time, his testosterone drops. And it never returns to pre-birth level. Now, at this point, I can see lots of anxious men's faces. <laughs> Let me tell you that there is a massive benefit to this. First of all, the lower your testosterone, the more sensitive a father you are, able to meet your child's every need. Secondly, OK, you do get a drop in testosterone, but that is matched by increasing impact of the dopamine and oxytocin that are released when you interact with your child. I Meaning those interactions are immensely euphorically rewarding and that you build a tight bond based on oxytocin. We know that if a man lives with his pregnant partner, then their oxytocin levels come into synchrony, a phenomenon known as biobehavioural synchrony. And we think this is important in bonding that couple as tightly as they possibly could so as they can meet the challenges of parenthood as a team. And we've always known for, well, at least 10 years, that a mother's cha brain changes when she becomes a mum. But we now know that exactly the same happens to a father. We see increases in the white and grey matter in two key areas of the brain, highlighted in orange on this slide. At the core of the brain, we see the increase in the limbic area of the brain, where your emotions sit, so a father can nurture and show affectionate care to his child, as well as detect the risk that is important for him to see if that child is to survive. But then in the neocortex of the brain, your many-folded outer area of your brain, where your conscious mind sits, 
we see a massive increase, enabling that father to plan ahead, to problem solve, to take decisions so that he can be all he can be to his child. We also know that fathers build profound attachments with their children, but they are critically different to the attachment between a mother and a child. In the first instance, they are based on interaction. See, fathers don't get the head start of birth, where you get floods of beta endorphin and dopamine and oxytocin. So they have to build that bond based upon the interaction they have with their child. This can mean that their bond is delayed compared to the mother. But don't panic. It does come. And at around the six-month mark, the most wonderful interaction develops, rough and tumble play. We can all picture the scene of a father flinging his child around the room, aeroplaning them up towards the ceiling, tickling them till they're sick with laughter. That's fun, Dad. But fun, Dad, has a role. Because those wonderful, boisterous, exhilarating, physical, sometimes a little bit painful interactions produce a flood of beta endorphin and oxytocin and dopamine to both people who are involved in that play. So the child and his or her father build the most deep bond. And this form of interaction is particularly important in our time-short world here in the West. Because with fathers out of the home a lot of the time, they need to make quick efforts to build that bond with their child, to get to know their child, and for their child to get to know them. And they do this by this time-efficient, very quick form of behaviour. Secondly, evolution hates redundancy. So critically, the attachment between father and child and mother and child is different. There's no point evolving two people to do exactly the same role. And we see these differences even in the centre of the brain. In the first instance, the attachment between the mother and the child is inward-looking, exclusive, based on affection and care. The dad's attachment is also obviously capable of being affectionate and caring, but on top of this, there's an extra bit. His job is to challenge to be the secure base from which the child goes out into the world to investigate what is going on. His role is to teach the skills, behavioural, linguistic, cognitive, that will enable that child to deal with life's challenges, assess its risks and leap over those hurdles, to deal with failure but also with success. We live in the most complex social and technological world and Dad's job is to turn the child's face to that world and go, here is the world and I am going to teach you how to be successful in it. And in that world where we have a crisis in teenage mental health and we're running our social relationships at greater and greater distance due to social media, we need Dad more than ever before to help us navigate this complex world. You see, evolution leaves nothing to chance. And it has prepared dad to father, to parent. And dads are not just about the genes. I'm an anthropologist. My job is to study fatherhood around the world. And whilst we privilege the biological father here in the West, if I look around the world, generally, dad is the person who steps up and does the job. You see, dads are wonderfully flexible beings. Because they're not bound by the biology of pregnancy and childbirth and breastfeeding, they are able to change their behaviour more quickly, to respond to changes in the environment. And therefore, dad can be a stepdad, an adopted dad. Yes, the biological dad, whether he lives with his children or not. But he can be an uncle, a grandfather, a friend. Some children have whole teams of fathers. Dad is there to make sure that child survives. Why is this important? Why do we need to know all this? Well, you see, fun, number one, dad isn't who we think he is. Yes, some fathers are absent, but that's not the whole story. That's not the whole spectrum of fathering behaviour. We tend to put mum on a pedestal, quite rightly, but dad is left on the floor, labelled as either absent or inept. I think we need to balance that negative story with the positive and get a full reality of what fathering is today. Secondly, dads are more involved in their children's lives today than ever before. Now, there are some practical and societal reasons for this. We have reductions in health care, which means mum is often dispatched from the hospital on the day she's given birth. Many of us don't live near the extended families who in the past would have helped us. And now, with the economy as it is, many of us are dual earner households, which means both parents both have to earn and to parents to make life work. So quite often, dad is there literally catching the baby. But also, in the 10 years that I've been researching fathers, I've seen a change 
in how important they feel they are in their children's lives. By knowing what we know now about fathers, they are empowered to be involved. They know they are important and that they are meant. But the problem is, you see, is that society isn't quite ready for this view of fatherhood. And many fathers come up against quite considerable societal and cultural barriers in being involved with their children. And this starts no sooner than when their partner is pregnant. My interviews with fathers are littered with stories about being excluded or alienated during pregnancy, birth and afterwards, of being shut out of midwife's appointments, of being ignored even though they are sitting in the room. And this isn't just in the UK. Across the world, from Sweden to Australia, South Africa to Canada, we have the same stories about alienation. And while many governments talk about their family-friendly policies, I'm afraid a lot of it is lip service because, you see, we're not ready as a culture to accept fathers being involved with their families, to take paternity leave, for example. Many fathers struggle in their work environment to be granted this right, and some of them suffer penalties from taking it. And the fact that, I'm afraid, it's not properly financed means that it's only actually available to the very wealthy. Because, you see, the thing we know is that if you provide men with paternity care that is ring-fenced and that is properly financed, men take it up with enthusiasm. In Finland, 90% of men take their full nine weeks of ring-fenced financed paternity leave. In Quebec, in the first year in which ring-fenced financed paternity leave was available, the uptake was 250% higher than the year before, and it continues to build. You see, fathers want to be involved and they want to care. We just have to give them the tools to do it. And the other thing to say is it's not just good for the father. If we empower men to take paternity leave, then we increase domestic equality in the home where domestic chores and childcare are shared equally. We lower the mothering tax that's placed on mothers' careers because they're able to go back to work earlier, safe in the knowledge that their partner is caring for their child. And we start to close that all-important gender pay gap that we've heard so much about. Because women carry less penalty on their pay. And we know that these effects cross generations. In countries where they've had ring-fenced finance paternity leave, this has crossed generations because sons see their fathers in the home, in the domestic setting, sharing the care of their children. And that is their model for going forward. So we can cause a cultural change. So I think we need to change the conversation about fathers. And I hope by listening to me today and understanding just some of the science that we know behind fathers now, that you will want to change the conversations you have. Because you see, fathers are meant. They are biologi biologically primed to father, to parent. And in a world where no one can raise a human child on their own, it's important that we have their input into our children's development. Yes, some fathers are absent and inept, but so are some mothers. And we have to make sure we have the full conversation about them. It is very true when we say it takes a whole village to raise a child. But let's just remember that right at the centre of that village is Dad. Thank you.